Hello again, and welcome to AP Live Review. My name is John Zania. I am an English teacher at Chelsea High School in Chelsea, Michigan, which is just outside of Ann Arbor, Michigan. And if you've watched our previous AP Live Review sessions, you know that we've been working through a review of each of the different tasks that you'll have to complete as part of the AP language exam. As a quick reminder, those tasks are the multiple choice section, which constitutes 45% of your exam score. Those were the videos that I worked with you on in previous sessions. And then we're also reviewing each of the three writing tasks or free response questions, which count for 55% of your overall exam score. My friend Alfonso recently worked with you on uh, question number one, which is the synthesis essay. Today we'll be turning to question two, which is the rhetorical analysis essay. And later our friend Alfonso will be back with you one more time to talk about the argumentative essay. So what will we learn today as we review for the rhetorical analysis essay? A few things. In this AP Daily Live review video, we will review the format and instruction for the rhetorical analysis free response question. We'll highlight strategies for reading and analyzing a prompt and a passage. We'll review some of the basic components and features of rhetorical analysis, things like rhetorical situation or different rhetorical choices. And we'll practice applying these strategies and skills to a sample prompt and text. But before we get to that, let's start with a quick warm up today to get our brains going here. Here is our question. What are the first five words or groups of related words that come to mind when you think about the process of rhetorical analysis? I'm going to pause here and give you 10 or 15 seconds just to think about what's running through your head before we review some possible answers. All right, with a question that open-ended, I wouldn't be surprised if we have a wide range of answers coming up here through your head. And certainly there was no one right set of wrong, uh, right or wrong answers here today. But let's take a look at some possible responses you might have come up with. Some of you might've thought of a phrase we've already heard once today in our video of a rhetorical situation, something that's really at the center of the process of rhetorical analysis. In my classroom, when we talk about the rhetorical situation, we use an acronym called SOAPS to remember the different pieces of that rhetorical situation. And different classrooms may describe it in slightly different ways, but that might be one place that automatically some of our heads go. Others of you might've started to think about the basic appeals involved in rhetoric, appeals to ethos, pathos or pathos, and appeals to logos. Those are pieces of what we call the rhetorical triangle, which again is a very foundational piece, some of the most basic persuasive appeals we might make when persuading an audience. Others of you beyond those appeals might have started to think about different pieces of English language or writing or composition that help make a piece more effective. We could have thought of things like diction, when an author uses specific words with strong connotations, or imagery, when we use our language to make sensory appeals. Others yet might have thought about maybe more specific rhetorical strategies outside of the rhetorical triangle. Things like anecdotes when we tell short personal stories, hyperbole when we exaggerate for effect, or analogies when we make comparisons between things to better explain something. Um, others beyond that might have just thought of a basic purpose of rhetoric, which is essentially to persuade a reader or an audience of something. Oftentimes when we're doing analysis of an author's rhetoric, we are looking at the ways that author seeks to persuade. Or others yet might have really just centered in on that key word of the task of analysis, that when we go to do our writing, we have to make sure that we break down what the writer is doing, what choices the writer is making, and why. There might have been a number of other phrases or words that came to mind beyond the ones listed on screen. And in many cases, those would work well too. But 
a bottom line or takeaway from this warm-up question is to remember that, for one, many of us already know quite a bit about rhetoric as we head into the AP exam. If some or many or all of these words or concepts sound familiar, that's a very encouraging sign. And that should give you some confidence knowing that you already have some experience with this, that this is not a new task that we'll do on test day. Um, and secondly, I'd just like to point out as a reminder, and we'll review this more later on in the essay, as well, that for the rhetorical analysis task, there are multiple approaches to having success on that essay. We could have one student analyzing one set of choices and another student analyzing a slightly different set of choices, calling attention to different parts or layers of a text, and both of those students can be successful. We can have one student talk about something like an anecdote and use that terminology, and another student talk about something like a personal story without using that same tech, uh, terminology. And at the end of the day, both students are going to be rewarded similarly for seeing the choices that authors are making in their text. Um, so there's nothing that says we have to use all of the exact same strategies or choices. Nothing that says we have to use the same terminology, and certainly nothing that says we have to cover every choice an author makes in a text exhaustively in order to earn a passing score. So that reminder can also sometimes be a little bit freeing or reassuring and allow you to write with confidence about the things you see present in the text you're presented with. So with that as our warm up, let's start our review with some of the specifics related to the task of rhetorical analysis, starting with just a review of some of the main components of the task itself. First of all, your rhetorical analysis question will be labeled as question number two in the free response section of the exam. It's helpful to remember this because while it is presented as the second prompt, there is no rule that says you have to write this essay second. You'll find when you go to your answer booklet that you have freedom to answer the questions in whatever order you prefer. So for some students that feel like rhetorical analysis is a strength, you might want to jump over the synthesis essay and move right into rhetorical analysis when it comes time to draft your essays. For others of us, if this is a weak spot or an essay we typically struggle with, we might want to save this for last, knowing that we can still put our best foot forward with our other two essays. But at the end of the day, this will be the second question that you see. The College Board will recommend that you spend 40 minutes on your rhetorical analysis essay. Again, that is a recommendation. There's no hard and set rule that says you must spend 40 minutes there, though generally speaking, it's a good idea to stick to that so that you save enough time for your other essays as well. The passage that you'll see on the rhetorical analysis question will be some sort of nonfiction prose that is about 600 to 800 words in length. We never know going into test day what type of nonfiction prose we will see. So it may be something like a letter, could be a speech that was delivered, could be an excerpt from an article or an essay, or any other type of nonfiction writing that we may encounter. So we have to be prepared to analyze a wide range of different sorts of writing. And lastly, the prompt will invite us to write an essay that analyzes the writer's rhetorical choices. Uh, so that essay will include components like a thesis statement. We have to be able to bring evidence from the text into our own essay to show where the author is making the choices we say the author is. We have to provide explanation and analysis of why the author is making those choices, how they impact the text or the impact on the reader. We also have to show an understanding of the rhetorical situation related to the text. And we have to demonstrate in our essay appropriate grammar and punctuation as well. Uh, these are the main components of the essay itself. And we will look more closely in our next review video at actually constructing some of these pieces of the essay itself. But our focus for today will be on the important first step of reading and analyzing the prompt and passage. I like to remind my students that even though our score comes from the essay we write, this is a reading test. 
before it is an essay writing test. We can't write a successful rhetorical analysis if we don't have a strong command of the different choices the author is making in the text. So we have to make sure we invest enough time and attention and effort into the reading before we start thinking about the uh, essay writing itself. And each student I know reads and marks and annotates and writes at a different pace. In my classroom, I tend to encourage my students to use the first 10 to 15 minutes to read and annotate and mark that passage carefully, perhaps do a little bit of outlining or brainstorming or a drafting of a thesis before moving into the essay writing itself. So remember to invest time in the reading process before we move ahead to the writing itself. When it comes time for reading, I encourage my students to really think about splitting the reading into two halves, two different tasks that we have to address or two layers of the prompt that we see. The first one is analyzing what I refer to as the prompt. That's essentially the setup or background information that the College Board provides to us. And this is crucial to read because this provides us with what we call the rhetorical situation. The College Board will give us pieces about who wrote the text and when and where and why that we can incorporate into our analysis. And many times analyzing the prompt or analyzing the background information is almost as important as analyzing the actual speech or letter or article or essay excerpt itself. So specifically when we see the prompt, we would want to make sure we start by working to understand the main components of the rhetorical situation. Again, I know that every teacher has their own way of, of teaching this or maybe their own approach or terminology or way to remember this. For what it's worth, the College Board in our course and exam description says that the rhetorical situation includes six components. The first one is called the exigence. College Board tells us that the exigence is the part of a rhetorical situation that inspires, stimulates, provokes, or prompts writers to create a text. I like to encourage my students to think of this as the spark that began the essay. What moved this writer or speaker into action? What was the situation or event or context that really demanded this piece come into existence in the first place? Related to that, we have to then think of the purpose that the writer has in mind. What does the author want to accomplish? How does the author want the audience to respond when hearing the text? A third component of the rhetorical situation is the audience. To whom is the speech or letter or uh, piece of writing intended or delivered? delivered. We want to make sure we have a sense, maybe sometimes this could be an individual person that has a specific relationship to the writer. It might be a group of people or a wide group of people, like an entire nation, that we want to consider the attitudes or values of that audience or that person or that group of people. But we have to have an awareness of who is listening to or reading the text. The next component of the rhetorical situation is the writer. We should again dig deep into who is the writer? What values does that writer bring to the table? Um, does that writer come to the table with certain biases or persuasions that is going to impact the way that writer writes or what that writer thinks? We can also think about the relationship between the writer and the audience. Is it a hostile relationship? Are they friendly with one another? Do they have to build a sense of connection? Those are all components of the rhetorical situation that can help us dig deeper into our analysis. We should also think about context, what is happening around the time that the text was written. Sometimes this is a particular year in history that we know important things were taking place. Other times the context might be a certain era or decade, but we can typically pull a few of those pieces to the table to understand why the writer is writing the way the writer is. And lastly, we can think about the message, what the author is saying. That's obviously a somewhat surface level piece of an essay or piece of writing, but Again, we can't analyze a piece successfully if we don't know what the author is saying. In my classroom, I like to use a variation of this called SOAPS, which stands for speaker, occasion, audience, purpose, and subject. You can see a lot of the pieces of the rhetorical situation previewed above incorporated into that SOAPS just with a little bit different terminology. And really, regardless of if your teacher teaches this one way or another, these are all getting at the same core components, which suggests that when we read a piece of writing, we have to consider all of the different elements that went into the way that piece of writing was crafted. 
And sometimes knowing the rhetorical situation also allows us as writers to bring our own expertise and knowledge to the table as well. Let's say, for instance, I am a student who has a strong background in history. I might recognize a text that was written during a certain historical time and be able to pull my understanding of the nuances or details of that era into my rhetorical analysis. Or I may already know something about the author of the piece, in which case I can bring my understanding or awareness of that to my own analysis as well. So we want to work with what the College Board provides for us in the prompt. We also want to work with our own background awareness and understanding. And only after we have analyzed the rhetorical situation closely, can we actually then move into an anal analysis of the passage. Since most choices in the passage or the text were made in response to that specific rhetorical situation. When we approach the passage, general active reading strategies apply. We want to read carefully to develop an accurate understanding of the writer's message or claim. That means we should do things like looking to underline a central thesis statement, um, making comments about patterns that we notice in the text, or drawing attention to major shifts in the text. We want to read and mark actively, just like we talked about with our multiple choice text as well. Beyond that, we have to pay attention to the choices that a writer is making in the text uh, in order to make that text more purposeful or more powerful. The term choices really opens up the door to a wide range of different things we might consider or talk about. And again, as review, a lot of students might start their analysis with uh, look out for the basic components of our rhetorical triangle. That again would be how the author is appealing to ethos building the author's credibility, building a sense of connection with the audience, talking about shared values, showing that the, audience, uh, the speaker is trustworthy and that the audience has reason to believe what the speaker is saying. That's one basic choice many writers might make. Second point of the rhetorical triangle we might look out for are appeals to logos. This is typically when the author brings evidence to support an idea, whether in the form of statistics or data, could be quote that, a quote that comes from a respected figure. It might be the author unpacking the author's reasoning in support of a position. But often good, strong arguments have some logical basis for, uh, for what they are trying to say. And the third point in the rhetorical triangle we might look out for is an appeal to pathos or pathos, however your teacher says that. This is our appeal to emotion, whether evoking strong positive emotions like hope or excitement or happiness, evoking negative emotions like fear or anger or outrage or any other sort of emotion that might move a person to act or respond in a certain way. Many students start their rhetorical analyses with, look, with looking for these basic rhetorical appeals. But at the same time, I want to remind you that there are choices that authors make that go beyond these basic appeals or on top of or in conjunction with these appeals. Sometimes in scoring essays, what I and others will see is students really limit or restrict their rhetorical analysis just to these three basic components. And what that leads to is an essay that feels limited. It feels like the student only understands one of a handful of choices when there's a range of things a writer might do to make a piece more effective. It also sometimes feels like the student forces those terms into the analysis just to prove to the AP score that they know what the rhetorical triangle is. But we don't have to stop or necessarily use just those basic appeals. Here are a few examples of things we could look for beyond the rhetorical triangle. We might look again, as we talked about earlier, for strong instances of diction, word choice that evokes a particular response that carries a certain connotation with it, whether positive or negative. We might again look at strong instances of imagery or other figurative language where the writer's using language to evoke a certain picture in the, on the reader's head. We could look for other examples of figurative language like metaphors, compare, direct comparison of one thing to another, or similes, a comparison using like or as. We could look at times when an author really stretches the truth of a statement or um, by, by using hyperbole, exaggerating something for a certain effect.
Again, we mentioned earlier in the video, there are a number of other rhetorical devices, many of them with fancy Greek names um, that we could call attention to as well. Things like allusions, references to well-known uh, historical figures or famous quotes or works of literature or art. Those anecdotes we talked about earlier, those short personal stories, things like concessions where we show our opponents that we are aware of their perspective and sometimes even can lend validity to their perspectives. Rhetorical questions where we ask a question with a clearly implied answer. There are dozens more that we could pull from. And if you and your teacher have worked through those this, this year, those would be great things to call attention to as well. And we might also look at structural elements, choices an author makes related to building paragraphs, building um, an essay composed of multiple paragraphs, how those different pieces of an essay align structurally. Things like the juxtaposition or putting side by side of two elements. We might notice an author use compare and contrast structure in an essay to develop a point or make an argument. Within the sentences themselves, we might notice parallel structure where phrases follow a similar pattern of parts of speech to help unify or connect those different pieces. Or we might notice other choices related to syntax, things like how long or short certain sentences are, how compound or complex they may be. Choices related to punctuation within, in the middle of, or at the end of a sentence. All of these are choices that are fair game for us to call attention to. The more of these that you can pay attention to and notice and mark in the passage that you're analyzing, the greater success you are likely to have on that essay because you are pulling from a more dynamic set of rhetorical strategies. Um, a few last points here before we start to try to apply this to a practice example. Number one, some of these strategies are not mutually exclusive from one another. What I mean by that is we might see certain strategies overlap with or complement one another. Let's give a basic example of a writer who uses diction with a lot of really harsh connotations, connotations that make us angry or make us unsettled to hear them. We might notice then that that use of diction actually is also part of an appeal to pathos or pathos that by using certain words, the author evokes a certain emotion or response from us. We, if we're doing successful rhetorical analysis, we're looking at the interplay of these different elements. Another basic example, we might see an author make a concession to an opponent before refuting that perspective with new evidence or new logic. And a lot of times when we use a concede and refute pattern, we are appealing to logic. We are showing the reasoning within a piece of writing at work in a text. And so the more we can highlight the ways that different rhetorical strategies play on one another or impact one another, the more success we'll have in our essay. One last note before we take a look at a practice passage here is that it is not necessarily crucial that we use the exact terminology we are seeing on screen here today. For instance, if you described an author as putting two things side by side, at the end of the day, that's going to carry just about as much weight with a college board scorer as it would to call that putting of two things side by side juxtaposition. Whether a student knows that something is an illusion or merely a reference to a famous book, ultimately does not make a big impact in the overall score of the essay. As long as we are describing the choices accurately and able to explain not only what those choices look like in the text, but how they impact the text and how they help the author achieve the author's purpose, we are doing the task of rhetorical analysis. So if you see something in a text, but you can't remember the term, or you don't exactly know what it's called, do the best you can to describe that in your essay, and the reader will try the best that the reader can to support you with that and reward you for that. So in our next essay, we will talk about, in our next video, we'll talk about what it would look like to take some of these analyses and turn them into an actual essay. But for today, we're going to use our practice time to reinforce those approaches we just talked about, how to analyze a prompt in a passage using the different components reviewed. To help with our review, we have linked for you and posted for you some review materials in a Google folder that's accessible using the link that you have on screen here today. If for some reason you're not able to access this link or you're not able to find the support materials, 
that's okay. I'll do my best to present everything we need up on screen for you so that you can, you can work with what's, um, what's appearing on your screen today. But I know for many of us, it's easier or more preferable to work with the full passage in our own PDF or on our own screen. So feel free to use the link provided. Feel free to use what's posted on screen for you as well. All right. So our practice prompt today comes from the 2018 AP language exam. This is a good example of what it's going to look like on test day, because this is what it looked like on a recent test day as well. So to remind us our first step before we actually look at the text, we should spend some time very critically breaking down the pieces of the rhetorical situation. And we can access most of those pieces in the prompt that the College Board provides for us. What I want to encourage you to do is to take a few minutes, whether looking at your own PDF or what's on screen here, to do your own reading and analysis of our prompt. Use the prompts up on screen here to help. See if we can identify the exigence. What was the, what was the thing that sparked this piece of writing we're going to be analyzing? What created it? What was at the core of its inception here? See if we can identify who the speaker, occasion, audience, purpose, and subject are, and what the relationship among those parts might be. And see if we can think about how the elements that are in the rhetorical situation may impact the crafting of the text that we're about to read. We can do a little bit of anticipating there using the information the College Board has provided for us. I'm going to encourage you to pause the video if you need a few minutes to do that work. When you are ready to resume, press play, and I'll talk you through my thoughts here. I'll do a little bit of a think aloud or modeling of how we might work with a rhetorical situation using a prompt like this. All right, let's take a look at what we have here. One of the first things that I noticed to highlight just a few is our exigence of our speech. We are at a commencement ceremony for Mount Holyoke College. So this is a speaker, as is the case for so many other commencement ceremonies, that's been invited to address the graduating class. And we can start to think then, knowing that that was the reason for the speech in the first place, how that might impact the approach that Madeleine Albright takes in the speech. Most commencement speeches, for instance, are celebratory circumstances. Um, this is a ceremony that's likely going to be happy. People want to be excited and happy about what's happening for the graduates here. Um, so in many cases, the author is going to try and make sure that this isn't a speech with an ominous tone or too heavy or dark of a tone. This is going to celebrate or encourage or put a positive spin on the experience of the graduates. We know that many commencement speech commencement ceremony speakers will try to do one of a few things, perhaps inspire the graduating class to now take what they have learned and go on to do great things with those skills and that knowledge. Sometimes speakers will share wisdom or advice. Typically, it's not just anybody that's invited to a commencement ceremony. It's someone who has something worthwhile to share with the audience. So we might expect that kind of wisdom or advice sharing to come out in a speech like this. A lot of times, a commencement ceremony speaker might try to give the graduating class a sense of purpose, a goal, um, a vision to try and go and fulfill. So knowing the exigence here, we can already walk into the text looking for the ways that the speaker might achieve those kinds of purposes or uphold that kind of tone. I also noticed that in our prompt, we were given very clear statement of who our audience was. We know that uh, this is the graduating class of Mount Holyoke College, which is a women's college in Massachusetts. And we also know that our speaker is United States Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. And to me, that relationship between the speaker and the audience seems especially important. We know that this is a woman in a position of power, something that had been somewhat rare throughout the history of the United States. Speaking to a group almost exclusively here outside of family members and friends, uh, almost exclusively women, young women in this case, who maybe haven't had the life experience that Madeleine Albright has rising to her position. 
Knowing that, she is likely going to advise them on what they are to encounter moving forward into the world as young women. She has some experience to work with. And we also know that she comes from a position of great power. So not only will she have automatic respect from her audience, but they are most likely to really truly listen to her advice, take it as worthwhile, and try their best to apply it to their lives. There are other small pieces we might be able to notice, like our occasion of 1997 as a specific date, just lets us know that perhaps this was the time when Madeleine Albright was serving as Secretary of State there. Um, but beyond that, those basic components now give us a lot of fuel for our analysis. We can move into the text knowing a little bit of the dynamic at play, what to anticipate, and what to look for. I want to remind you as well, as we look at this prompt, that we can identify most of these pieces of the rhetorical situation, even if we've never heard of Madeleine Albright, or we don't know what or where Mount Holyoke College is. The College Board is going to give us some really vital information in that prompt, which is why we have to do everything we can to make uh, take advantage of every little morsel of information that's presented to us. Once we feel like we have a solid understanding of the prompt and the rhetorical situation, we can then turn our attention to the text to be analyzed. I know if you pulled up the support materials at home, you have the whole speech there ready for analysis. So if you'd like to go ahead and pause and do a full analysis before coming back for the think aloud and review, feel free. If you need to work off of what's on screen here today, that's all right as well. And I wanna encourage you at this point to go ahead and pause your video um, as we're working through, try to think through, for one, what we notice Madeleine Albright saying here. Think also about how she is saying it. Do we notice any rhetorical choices in her writing that may make this writing more purposeful? And lastly, I encourage you to think about why she is saying it in the way that she is. Um, why are those choices crucial to her relaying her point or her tone or her message or achieving her purpose? why would she say things the way that she does? Go ahead and press pause, take the time you need to read through this section here. And when you're ready for my Think Aloud, you can press play to resume. Okay, as we get ready to think aloud, model what you might take from a section of the text like this, I want to give you a reminder, first of all, that you are not expected in the rhetorical analysis essay to identify every single choice in every single sentence and paragraph of the text. If anything, students who try to do that tend to give those choices short shrift. We tend not to really dig into them with much depth, and we don't have a sense of unity among the parts of our essay. So more likely, what we want to try to do is is filter out some of the smaller choices we see the author making so that we can draw more attention to the really central choices present in the text or the choices that are really driving the, uh, the driving force of the text in particular. So I'll model that by highlighting just a few things that I notice. One pattern that I saw emerge here early in the first few lines was a contrast of choices that Albright tells her audience that we have. Starting in lines one and two, she tells us we have a choice of whether to live our lives narrowly, selfishly, and complacently, or to act with courage and faith. I noticed that those choices are presented in a way through the word choice and phrasing that makes one sound really negative, lots of words like narrow, selfish, complacent, words we wouldn't want attached to ourselves. With words that are more positive, courage and faith, the author is presenting these two options as a way to suggest to the audience subtly that of course we should pursue the more positive path of action. I saw that pattern repeat in lines four through 10 when the audience broadened from just individuals to a nation as a whole. Here it comes the choice again. We can turn inward and betray the lessons of history, or we can choose to seize opportunity before us to shape history. So twice in a row, two paragraphs in a row, the author used the same pattern in setting up those paragraphs to establish this choice. Notice how the diction was underscoring those two potential routes that a person might take. And the audience then, or the speaker, excuse me, is subtly nudging the audience towards that more positive, noble path. Um, 
As we continued further on into the paragraphs, I noticed a variation of this same choice taking place. The author starts to speak particularly about the Clinton administration and what the United States had done in recent history. We, in line nine, hear that the administration and nation could have been satisfied with the fall of the Berlin Wall, but instead enlarged and adapted NATO to create a future where every democracy is a builder of peace. It's a slightly different way of phrasing that idea, but again, we notice this pattern. We could do this negative or complacent thing. Instead, we strive to do something more and positive and better. We can see the same thing happening in lines 16 and 17. We could relax after nuclear weapons were no longer targeting our home. Instead, we are working to reduce nuclear arsenals. Notice how these sentences are phrased very similarly. There's some parallel structure at work there, repetition of the basic parts of speech there with just different examples and variables plugged in. This is a way for the speaker to help create a sense of unity or consistency against those, those ideas. And it's a way to help the reader see that pattern emerge more clearly. This is clearly a choice the author is making, something she wants us to notice as we listen or read. So we wanna pay attention to that as well. I noticed that same pattern one more time in lines 21 and 22. After the fighting in Bosnia has stopped, we could turn our backs now. Instead, we are renewing our commitment. And then on and on come the details supporting that commitment. I think that pattern is really important. It's clear 20 some lines into the speech that the author is setting an example. The author is using the United States, the Clinton administration, the history of the country as a guide or a model for what others should follow. Um, to add to this, I noticed another, a few other small choices coming up here. In line seven, the author noticed that noted that it was the Clinton administration that was providing the leadership, helping to make these choices. It's maybe worth noting that this is a chance for the speaker to perhaps score a few easy political points for the administration here. This is maybe a way for the a speaker to establish the authority as someone who is leading by example, which therefore means the audience will want to follow that example. That's another choice that I see present in the text as well. And if we want to call attention to something like that, we certainly could. It's certainly going to add to our awareness of how the rhetorical situation is impacting these choices. But again, ultimately, it's not crucial to cover every single choice. So if we missed something in there, that is ultimately okay. And even moving out of this first set of paragraphs, if I walked away and went into my essay highlighting just one of those things, the author's use of parallel structure to suggest what we could do versus what we should do, the author's pattern of these negative resting spots followed by these positive goals to strive for, or the author's establishing of her own authority as a position, person in a position of power in America, in a presidential administration. If I were able to highlight even just one of those as an opening choice, that would get my rhetorical analysis essay off to a strong start. Let's move on to the next section of the essay, the speech, I should say. If you've already read and analyzed this, you can keep the video rolling and we'll do our commentary in a moment. But if you need a minute to pause and do your own breakdown, that's fine. I'll remind you once again, similar approach here. Not only should we think about what Madeleine Albright is saying, but we should think about how that is being said, what choices are being made in the writing and why those choices are being made or how they impact the text being delivered. Take a few minutes and we'll come back together for commentary in just a moment. All right, as we look at this section, perhaps that last, uh, last slide in our slideshow helped you notice a pattern that continued on throughout the next few lines in the speech, starting in line 32. We hear the author tell us about a growing world economy. We could stop there. Instead, we are pursuing broader prosperity. So there we are um, once again, 
essentially highlighting this pattern that's been now present for the entire first section of the speech. We notice the same thing play out in the second paragraph here. We could lower our voices, sit sedately down. Instead, women everywhere are standing up, spreading the word that we are ready to claim our rightful place as full citizens. So two more times, we notice that pattern of parallel structure, that pattern of what we could versus what we should or do do playing out. And this is more of the same then, the author really encouraging the audience to think about not being complacent, not sitting where they are, but striving to move things forward. I did notice a very interesting shift around line 38. I noticed that rather than talking in general about what the United States has done or the Clinton administration had done, I noticed the author here pivot to talk about the status of women. Here is maybe where understanding our rhetorical situation comes in especially handy. We know the author is speaking to a group of young women at a college. We know that she is a woman herself. So there is a connection there. And this focusing of the speech to this topic is going to make the content of the speech that much more applicable to the audience and resonate that much more fully with them. Knowing the soaps in that situation was so important, helps us know why this choice is going to resonate. And as we move forward through the rest of the speech, we are going to see the author maintain that slightly more narrow focus on women and the status of women, which makes sense given where she's speaking and um, what she's speaking about. Beyond that, um, I noticed one more small choice that I'll call attention to here. While again, there are other things we could talk about. In line 46 and 47, I noticed the author reference a phrase from Wendy Wasserstein that says that Mount Holyoke is the home of uncommon women. Using that quote there, perhaps from someone who knows the school well or is an authority figure herself, is a way, I think, for Albright to add a layer of somewhat welcome pressure, we'll say. It's reminding the young women that they go to an, an elite school, a school with a strong reputation, a place that they are very fortunate to be at. And it's going to suggest that, therefore, they need to live up to the expectations of the school. They need to embody that idea of being uncommon women. And so we might say that the author here is appealing to pathos, that the author is trying to evoke that sense of pride or maybe the pressure that comes along with that pride just through a small reference or small phrase there. So far through the speech, again, we wouldn't be expected to notice all of those choices or dedicate full paragraphs to all of those things. Again, we have to operate with something of a filter so that we have time to really fully analyze the choices we highlight. To recap, what I might be thinking so far two slides into this review of the text is that I certainly want to highlight the idea of the different choices that we could do versus what we should do, that that seemed to be a driving force here. And then beyond that, I might want to highlight the way that the speech has gradually narrowed from the nation as a whole to a focus on young women in particular. So given the audience, the rhetorical situation, I think that's a really crucial element at work. All right, let's move on to our third slide here. Uh, some more paragraphs from our speech. Similarly, if you are ready for commentary, you can continue the video here. If you need to pause for your own review quickly, that's fine as well. Maintain that focus on choices we see being made, why those choices are being made, how they help the author achieve her purpose. All right. As I look at the slide here from the broad view, one of the things I noticed just jumping among a few slide, a few paragraphs here is more of that parallel structure here. We noticed that several, several paragraphs are started with or early on in the paragraph have this phrase of in followed by the name of a place in Sarajevo, in Burundi, in Guatemala, in Burma. So four consecutive paragraphs, the author takes us to a different part of the world. And within that paragraph, the author shares some personal experience she has meeting women in those nations who are working to take their countries from places of trouble or conflict to places where there are greater freedoms or greater prosperity for all people, women included. 
I think the author is doing this for a number of reasons. For one, the fact that she constantly tells us, I have met with these people. I have seen these people. It's again, a way for her to establish her authority. It lets us know that she has reason to be saying the things she's saying, that those ideas aren't just coming out of thin air. Beyond providing those anecdotes that give her a sense of authority, I also noticed that in each of these instances, the author is describing a woman from a part of the world that has encountered conflict or encountered trouble. In some cases, some of these nations may not have the same kinds of resources as other nations around the world do. Yet in all of those cases, those women rose to the challenge, refused to accept um, the troubles or conflicts that they encountered, and instead used their resources and their initiative to work to a better place. So I think this is a way for the author to suggest that these women can be models for the young women of Mount Holyoke College as well. Again, she wants them to follow in the footsteps of the example being set here. Um, and I think there's a sort of message that, hey, if these women are able to accomplish these things in their nations, you should be able to accomplish similar things in your future as well. After those references to women in different parts of the world, I noticed the author around line 68 offer a very short sentence. I think it's the shortest sentence of the entire speech here. She says that each has persevered. And she says this after offering a concession that each has suffered blows, but each proceeded with courage. That idea of persevering, we notice it again coming up at the end of line 75 have courage still and persevere. Already, this is becoming something of a refrain toward the end of the speech. It's maybe the author's main message embodied in a very short space. The short statement makes it perhaps a little bit more blunt. The repetitive nature of that phrasing also helps that idea resonate with the audience more fully. And it makes it easier for the audience to hear that as kind of a key takeaway or a main idea that they should take from the text here. Um, and ultimately, we get to the end of this section, and the audience is likely feeling empowered, feeling like, yes, they are, their struggles or their potential conflicts or hurdles they will encounter are understood by the author here, the speaker, that she knows it's going to be hard, but she's nevertheless wants them to press on. She has been through it before. She has the expertise to say that those things can be overcome or conquered with commitment uh, and perseverance. And remember, we had said that in a, a commencement speech, this is likely what an author wants to do, provide encouragement, provide a vision, provide a goal for people going forward. So it seems like the author is following the expectations we had set going in. And that's part of why knowing the rhetorical situation is especially crucial. So what would I add to my line of analysis or line of reasoning at this point in the essay? Remember, I'd always already maybe decided I want to dedicate paragraphs to the um, two choices or alternatives that the author had drawn attention to. I wanted to dedicate perhaps a paragraph or space to how the focus narrowed to, to women in particular. Maybe I would now add the way that she uses these examples of women from around the world to provide a model for women to follow. And she starts to come now with a very blunt example of encouragement to persevere as something of a lasting message in the speech. I can already start to picture or see what my handful of body paragraphs in my essay might look like. All right, let's progress on to our last set of paragraphs here. Again, one more time, if you've already read these, you can continue watching for my notes and commentary. If you need to pause for a moment here to do your own analysis, that's okay. Pay attention to what choices come to mind, how those choices impact whether or not this is a persuasive or successful text, and how those choices connect to our exigence or our rhetorical situation. Okay, for maybe the second time in this video, we're seeing what we had just talked about come to play again in this new set of paragraphs. The more we notice patterns, the more that's a good thing. That's a, that suggests that the author is very intentionally doing something in a text, and that's a red flag for us as analyzers that we should pay close attention to it. So I noticed once again, not only the repetition of that refrain in line 80, have courage still and persevere, or line 87, 
have courage still and persevere. The same thing coming up in line 93. Not only are we getting that restatement of that encouraging phrase, but many of those are preceded by concessions to what the young women might encounter. Um, she tells us line 76, you will be confronted by those who say your efforts to change the world or improve the lot of those around you do not mean much. Um, later in the next paragraph, she told us in line 82 that you may find your strongest beliefs ridiculed and challenges. Principles that you cherish may be derisively dismissed by those claiming to be more practical or realistic than you. Those are both examples of concessions. This is a great way for an author to make a claim more nuanced or more reasonable, showing an awareness of maybe the downside or the hurdle of something before coming back with either a refutation of those ideas or uh, outweighing those ideas, suggesting that there's something that counts even more. Um, so that is certainly then in conjunction with what we saw in the last slide, something I'd wanna call attention to. Why is she making these concessions and refutations? Why is she coming back to that refrain? That's supposed to provide that sense of encouragement and empowerment that she wants to be present in her essay. As we moved beyond that, I noticed in the last paragraph, the author add, once again, this extra layer of pressure, maybe we'll say, summoning the young women in the name of the historic college and all who have passed through its halls. It is a reminder to these young women that they follow in the footsteps of great people. They have a high standard to uphold. And it's a way to then, again, with encouragement, um, somewhat pressure or pull the women, young women into following that role, fulfilling sort of their expectations as graduates of Mount Holyoke. And I noticed toward the end of the speech, the author really spiral outward. We started to talk not just about a friend being touched and a life being enriched, but a soul being inspired, barriers to justice being brought down. And then once again, lines 105 to 107, we really spiral outward from your own life to others, to your country, to the earth as a whole. I thought that was a fantastic way for the author to again, having focused just on the role of young women, really explode the influence of that out to suggest an even wider range of people are gonna be impacted by the way that these young women lead their lives. There again were other choices in the speech that we could call attention to. I know that there is a quote by Robert Kennedy that a lot of my students like to analyze when we practice with this prompt. You might have seen other syntactical choices, other persuasive strategies, clear examples of diction. But for what it's worth, we again have to read somewhat with that filter and recognize that we're only going to have 40 minutes to write our essay. We have to really prioritize the biggest ideas. So I'll provide here a quick recap. Let's say I ended, uh, arrived here at the end of my reading on test day, and I've seen these different strategies that we've highlighted in the video. What would I wanna make sure I based my essay around, or what would I wanna pull as focal points of my body paragraphs in my essay? Overall, we really can only choose a handful. So I might choose number one, our author, um, using herself or her administration as an example of going above and beyond what a person or a group might do. Not just stopping at what we could do, but moving toward that higher aim of what we should do. I could dedicate an entire body paragraph just to noticing, drawing attention to, and analyzing the presence of that choice. I might spend a second paragraph talking about how she relates that pattern or that goal to young women in particular, and why, given the rhetorical situation, knowing her audience, that was a choice that made a lot of sense. I might provide a third body paragraph talking about how she provides models of women already living this way from her experiences around the world, not only to establish her ethos and her authority on the topic, but to provide some logic and some reasoning, some evidence that this way of living is possible and is already taking place. And I might talk about the last set of paragraphs where she offers concessions to how difficult that may be, but outweighs those concessions with her encouraging phrase of having courage and persevering how the bluntness of that statement really helps it resonate and seem encouraging and forceful and powerful to the listeners as well. That would provide the basis for a really wonderful rhetorical analysis essay. I could cover a number of choices, different sorts of choices as well, not all just the same thing over and over. And that would allow me to really cover choices being made at all parts of the text as well, not just those limited to the first paragraph or the last paragraph.
For one final point here, I want to provide a point of contrast to give you an idea of maybe sometimes what a weaker rhetorical analysis might look like. Sometimes I notice whether in my own classroom or scoring AP exams that students really limit the types of strategies that they talk about. Let's imagine in this case that we only looked at the diction that Madeleine Albright used and all we called attention to was places where her words sounded negative or angry or critical and then other places where her words sounded positive or hopeful. If that was what our analysis was based on, it'd be limited. It really wouldn't be looking at the full spirit of the choices being made in the text. And it would be hard for us then to be rewarded for everything that the author is doing here if we're limiting it to just that. Or to go back to something we talked about earlier in the text, if all we talked about was the author appealing to pathos and logos, and here is where the author made the audience excited, and here is where the author provided evidence of women leading certain types of lives. That might be a great starting point for us, but notice how just keeping it limited to ideas that fit within the realm of ethos, pathos, or logos really limits our discussion. It doesn't give us chances to talk about the diction or the phrasing, the syntax, the parallel structure, maybe the illusions. Um, it doesn't allow us to cover those same strategies with as much depth. So I really encourage you as best you can to try and cover a full range of strategies. Don't stick to just the surface level um, and don't feel like you can or should only talk about just one or two strategies. All right, as we reach the end of our review video, I know that there was a lot there, a lot of tips and suggestions, and a lot of practice rounds as well. Um, I also recognize we didn't talk about the actual writing of the essay itself much, and that's okay because we'll return to that in our next AP Live review session. But before we wrap up, I wanted to give you just a one minute breather here to take a big step back and reflect on how you can take what we learned today in our review of Madeleine Albright's speech and apply it on the actual exam prompt and passage. So I wanna ask you to think how that went for you, what lessons we learned from reviewing the sample prompt and passage, what we can remember to do or look out for on test day. Are there one or two or three things that we wanna make sure we have in the front of our heads? And what should we take away from our review? Why don't you take 15 seconds to try and respond to those prompts in your head? Okay. For the sake of closure, I know there's lots of different things we may have taken away, but a handful that I'm hoping you heard loud and clear today. Number one, that the rhetorical analysis section requires you to read both a prompt and a passage critically and actively. I want to remind you that it is a reading test first. So we can't jump ahead to our writing. We have to invest the time, energy, and effort into reading successfully before we can think about the essay. Number two, remember that identifying and analyzing the rhetorical situation is an important first step. Uh, think about the exigence of the passage. For my classroom, we think about the soaps or the message, the author, the purpose, the speaker, the subject, the occasion. All of those are important to consider. Third, there are many choices a writer can make in order to craft a text that is purposeful, or persuasive. Remember that you don't need to see all of them. We don't need all of the same terminology as well. Um, it's encouraging to remember that almost every spot in a text provided by the College Board is going to have some choices being made by the writer, so we want to make sure we dedicate our analysis to those choices. And lastly, that analysis requires focus not just on what is being said, but how it's being said and why it's being said that way. Our job is not to summarize the main point or message of an author's passage, but instead to analyze how the author constructed that passage and why, how those choices helped the author achieve the author's purpose given the specific rhetorical situation. I want to thank you for watching through to the end of this video. I know there was a lot there, so we appreciate you. In our next video, we'll take a look at what it would take to turn the analysis we did today into a successful rhetorical analysis essay that has all of the key components needed. I hope this has helped, and I want to close by reminding you in the words of my favorite football coach to go forth and attack each day with an enthusiasm unknown 
to mankind. Be confident, relax. You guys have got this.